Hello, come in, come in. Hi, nice to see you. Um, I just got this, um, it was right down there. I was looking for this. This was, um, this is my Derek Walcott collected poems, 1948 to 84. Though, of course, he's got, he went on, you know, to write. I've got his other epic poem, Omeros, and I've got various individual poems of him, but I'm not finding anything. But I've got this, which is lovely, because I thought... Um, I think that's his art as well on the, on the cover. He's quite a gifted painter. But he's a very painterly poet, in fact. Have a see. So, um... <sighs> Derek Walcott. I first uh, encountered Derek Walcott when an American friend of mine pulled a volume off the shelf and said, you've got to read this, and read me a bit of the poem, or a little sequence of poems called The Schooner Flight. And I was just entranced. I mean, just the sheer rhythm and lilt and beauty of the music and of the, of the music in the poetry. And, and then, obviously, it's a completely... Um, he was born in Santa Lucia in the Antilles. He's a Caribbean poet, and um, so there's a whole range of of, of imagery uh, and obviously history and and uh, the whole use of language, which was refreshingly different. And yet, at the same time, he he was clearly a complete master of iambic pentameter and of all the the um, the kind of craftsmanship of of high English poetry and I could see the more I read that he was completely soaked in the entire English poetic tradition and yet bringing this completely new perspective to it and it was really powerful combination of things he was as it were owning but then completely reshaping and making new making his own making West Indian um, a tradition I mean he's a person of mixed heritage both racially and also also linguistically I mean in the command both of mainstream English and also a tremendous ability to f hear and write and use patois um, he's got ancestors um, you know among the enslaved populations and ancestors from Warwickshire you know Shakespeare's county that were the enslavers and a lot of the power and honesty of his poetry comes out of that anyway um, None of those big issues were there for me when I first heard it. When I first heard it, what I heard was simply the sheer beauty of the poetry itself and the, the power of metaphor in it. Anyway, let, let, let me just read you, let me read you the, um, the first lines of, of Walcott's that I ever heard read, which is the, apart from the first part of his poetry sequence, The Schooner Flight. It starts actually with this, <coughs> it's almost a kind of, it's almost like Middle English alliteration. It's rather like Langland, you know. On a when he goes, you know, on a May morning in the Malvern Hills, I shrope me in shower shrouds as I a sheep wear. So here this starts. In idle August, while the sea soft and leaves of brown islands stick to the rim of this Caribbean, I blow out the light by the dreamless face of Maria Concepcion to ship as a seaman on the schooner flight. Out in the yard, turning grey in the dawn, I stood like a stone, and nothing else moved but the cold sea, rippling like galvanised, and the nail holes of stars in the sky roof. That's fantastic, where, you know, you could see the poverty of a place and the little piece of galvanised stuff on the roof, but the sea itself is then rippling like galvanised. And then the stars are like pinholes in the sky. I mean, it's extraordinary. And um, later on in that same thing, you know, he says, uh, you know, uh, he's leaving the woman he loves to go and ship on the, on the schooner. And uh, there's a wonderful thing about coming down to the harbour here. But Maria Concepcion was all my thought watching the sea heaving up and down as the port side of dories, schooners and yachts was painted afresh by the strokes of the sun, signing her name with every reflection. I knew when dark-haired evening puts on her bright silk at sunset 
and folding the sea, sidled under the sheet with her starry laugh, that there'd be no rest, there'd be no forgetting. It's like telling mourners round the graveside about resurrection. They want the dead back. Isn't it fantastic? So just, just you've seen when light falls on on moving water and the sunlight, and then the reflection is like up on the side of the boat, and it does look like dancing lines. It does look like like a signature. And for him, you know, the sun the sun is sign, signing the name of the girl that he's leaving on the signs of every boat. And then the way evening, as the sun goes down, is personified. As a, as a woman putting on a beautiful bright silk uh, dress, which is of course the sunset out at sea. Dark haired evening put on her bright silk at sunset and folding the sea sidled under the sheet with her starry laugh. He's both seeing the sunset at sea and the stars coming out and he's also remembering his lover whom he's left behind and they're just that's very Homeric, that. It's, you know, like the rosy-fingered dawn or the wine-dark sea. And, of course, later on he wrote this amazing epic, which was effectively a Homeric epic called Omeros. So he's uh, astonishing. So those, if you like, are very, very um, Caribbean scenes, and I read them as an Englishman and sense uh, the beauty of uh, something which is unfamiliar to me but attractive. But of course, this particular Caribbean poet has this English heritage so deeply that he can do the English thing as well. Uh, like, take this one from, from Midsummer, his set of, um, well, they're not quite sonnets, they're, they're, but they're um, like sort of super extended sonnets. But um, just listen to this for, for an evocation of Warwickshire. The oak inns creak in their joints as light declines from the ale-coloured skies of Warwickshire. Autumn has blown the froth from the foaming orchards, so white-haired regulars draw their chairs nearer the grate to spit on logs that crackle into leaves of fire. But they grow deafer, not sure if what they hear is the drone of the abbeys from Matins to Compline, or the hornet's nest of a chainsaw working late on the knoll up there, back of the Norman chapel. Evening loosens the moth. The owl shifts its weight. A fish-mouthed moon swims up from wavering elms. But four old men are out on the garden benches, talking of the bows they have drawn, their strings of wenches. Their coined eyes shrewdly glitter like the Thames estuaries, I heard their old talk, carried through cables across the Atlantic bed. Their gossip rustles like an apple's orchards in my own head. And I can drop their names like familiars, those bastard grandsires whose maker granted them a primal pardon because the worm that caused the rotting apple of the world and the hornet's chainsaw cannot touch the words of shallow and silence in their fading garden. It's fantastic. You suddenly realise that... This is the memory of the boy listening to a Shakespeare play, of course, listening to Henry V and, you know, Justice Shallow and Justice Silence and the way Shakespeare had drawn his pictures of the old men of Warwickshire. And then here's this man who's partly descended from somebody from Warwickshire, uh, listening to the Shakespeare as it's, it's played, you know, on the radio or it's been played on, 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 on the... Uh, uh, the wires that have passed under the Atlantic through cables laid across the Atlantic bed and hearing it afresh uh, and saying, you know, that, that scene sort of goes on you know, and the two symbols of, of all that passes and all that corrupts in time, you know, the, the chainsaw and the, uh, the worm that caused the rotting apple, that in spite of all that decay, something sustained and continuous in, as he says, cannot touch the words of shallow or silence in their fading garden. Um, yeah, so it's amazingly good poetry. And now I'm trying to reorder all my poetry books. Of course, I end up stopping and reading them instead of reordering. But there you go. That's what we do. Nice to see you. Thanks for dropping by.